I'd like to think about uh, the presentations collectively in terms of how I make sense of them in my interest uh, in teaching and my interest in thinking about some of the implications of, of the papers in my role as a language teacher, educator, and teacher, and things that, that particularly struck me across. Uh, the, the, collectively, I, I think that uh, they exemplify this idea of challenging received wisdom, conventional forms of knowledge. They bring to the forefront what, to me, agency can offer students in terms of engaging with the world, engaging with complacent frames of knowledge of who we are in a relationship with students. Uh, and, and it happens on different levels in each paper for me. The levels of materials that we recognize as suitable for education. And I'll use uh, Christian's term of the ways in which we reframe or re the materials of our, in our syllabuses. The, the absolute central role of the ethical engagement with students and, and the constant need to question our position and relationship and our, or our complacency in thinking we know where students are uh, that comes up in, in Lynn Mario's text. And going back in van der Leyen's presentation, the willingness to engage in materials the purposes of learning in which conventional wisdom is that these are debased forms of, uh, of activity that reproduce uh, lazy minds and poor resources for the future. So, so the courage and agency of a teacher willing to see in these materials and technologies uh, opportunities for uh, very uh, enlightening, humanizing forms of teaching when the vast majority of people don't recognize that. Um, and in Bruno's text, the, the absolute courage to challenge the narrative of the nation in which one might have primary allegiance or come from, what kind of practices it takes to challenge the kind of the, the narrative of the nation and the kinds of colorblind um, politics that you're talking about, to me, Rick comes to mind is what does the teacher do to engage in that in classes in what would be a hostile environment? And what kinds of pedagogies would be put into place to allow one to re uh, to open up the possibility for young, and, and, I, and I say this from the perspective of having two nephews in that are uh, kidding class, and what would they need to see the world in this dimension? And, and often hearing some disparaging comments about uh, the, Im the increasing immigration uh, uh, and immigration and their attitude towards indigenous people in Quebec. So, yeah, it's it's quite an interesting challenge to address the kinds of icons. And then um, Riley's project to me is is incredible to see uh, again putting into practice this relationship of, of theory and practice and this queer biopolitics research uh, project, particularly to see, we talked about this idea of affordances, the opportunities of new technologies to, um, to reimagine or to, to work around the kinds of identity politics that have destabilized destabilize or almost cripple the opportunity of collaboration. So it's, it's really interesting. We often just ignore this idea of what, what are the potential of these kinds of uh, digital resources to reimagine collaborative new kinds of um, solidarities. So I, in looking at them, again, they see the common thread of incredible potential to challenge uh, conventional ways of teaching and imagining curriculum. So I, I found that really exciting. So I'll stop there. And maybe we can we'll decide. Yeah, yeah. so uh, drawing from this idea of digital resources and solidarities that you mentioned, when the latest talk made me think about how materials circulate nowadays in this age of big data and huge chunks of uh, data uh, and there's the issue of storage, the production of uh, the archive, as I was mentioning this week too. And I, I, I really liked it 
when you cited uh, petticoats, uh, and then he said data changes, and that that is the, the key for me. It, it circulates and then it changes. It doesn't remain unaltered. Uh, I think that is a, a, a key uh, point when it comes to the circulation of, of data. And also, you you mentioned electronic games and. Uh, maybe an interesting dimension to add to the project that you have been developing from uh, the perspective of translation studies is uh, the localization of video games, which for you, uh, I'm not sure if uh, everyone is familiar with this area. It's the not only the translation, but the adaptation of video games to specific countries and regions in the world. Uh, so uh, one video game would be one in Portugal and it would be adapted to Brazil, to Brazilian Portuguese and to the Brazilian context. So maybe. Um, also, I have actually just finished a semester teaching a system course on cosmopolitics. Uh, and for this course we used a different bibliography. Uh, I think uh, interests converge, but the bibliography is sort of different. We have used Bruno Latour's uh, Who's Cosmos, Which Cosmopolitics article, and Isabel Stonger's Cosmopolitics series, and all taking uh, this perspective of a non Kantian approach to the cosmos, not looking for consensus. Uh, and Neo Kantian. Neo Kantian. Yeah, no, no, no Kantian. No Kantian. No contrasting with the idea of perpetual peace. So it's not about consensus for them. So it would maybe perhaps be a, a, an interesting bibliography to dialogue with yours. And my question for you would be regarding cultural compatibility. Uh, I'm not familiar with Jenkins' work, but I was just wondering if this compatibility uh, implies <coughs> consumption of cultural goods. Uh, this wasn't very clear for me. This cultural compatibility implies consuming these cultural goods. And uh, yeah, now moving forward to things. I need to ask him in the right questions, otherwise I'm probably going to be kicked out of the program. Yeah. But, yeah. Any controversial questions? You just look at them. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Well, as, you, as you know, I really like the idea of moving away from the semantics of the reference and focusing on translation rather than representation. And we are still discussing in our group Rancière's uh, books, and I'm still uh, starting to know his perspective on the distribution of the sensible. But, uh, I'm really interested in issues of intersemiosity uh, within Amerindian peoples and how this relates to parts and hopes. I have just finished translating a book uh, by Marilyn Stratton, the English anthropologist, and she talks about uh, neurology. Uh, how uh, talking about the other implies looking at how they classify parts and whole. So if you write about the other, you're also doing a mirography. Um, Mario's meaning the Greek word for parts. So maybe that would be an interesting perspective to relate to this idea of translation as metonymic. And I would really like to go into the specifics of the indigenous writing and uh, drawing, but maybe we could do it afterwards, since it's a very specific interest that we, we share. And I have also been thinking about 
indigenous poetics, you know, really has focused on, on the visual, but in the intersemiotic chain itself, uh, not uh, either the visual or the, the vocal, but the, just the, the process of the circulation uh, across codes. So this is something that we could perhaps discuss later. And the issue of agency, as we have been discussing in our group um, in, in Sao Paulo, we were discussing agency <coughs> as the encounter of connectivities and not just the individual. Uh, so agency is not something that could be reduced to one human or one individual. That's the deep perspective I tend to uh, I tend to use when looking at issues of agency at least. And now I'm still learning about settler sovereignty and colonialism and uh, Quebec and Canada with Bruno a lot. Uh, and I'm really, really interested in how discourses on indigeneity resonate uh, from our talks. Uh, we, I, I've been feeling that we could draw parallels. I am really interested in the idea of simultaneously challenging both Quebecois and English Canadian projects of sovereignty and I uh, as you were uh, presenting your talk I, re I remembered uh, when you are leaving the Quebec uh, side of, there's a bridge connecting Quebec and all <coughs> Right, a uh, bridge. Yes. So I, I remember a sign uh, that has uh, "Welcome" in four languages: Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English. And uh, it made me think about how Quebec could be located within the Americas and not just within Canada, and how this idea of seeing Quebec within this Pan-American context would reposition this territory for you. Um, I don't know if, um, if it resonates with some of what you have already thought of me. And we have about three more minutes, okay. I think. Okay. Just said something quick to Bruno. I, I'm really curious about the critique of uh, this derationalized or uh, the narrative of, of victimization across generations. So again, I'm thinking my young nephews. And especially, they are, are so cosmopolitan that they're thinking at the same time that they're also nationalistic. So it's an interesting because you're talking about this inherent contradiction of being colonized and colonizers, and I see the them again, and I wonder, because the music they're listening to, Montreal hip-hop and rap, again, it, it challenges the idea of the Pelin uh, pure Quebec culture, because they're listening to music that's got Haitian Creole in it, it's got elements, it's challenging the, the, the imagined space of, of language, as the marker of 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 the of the, the collective identity of this victimized society historically. So again, I'm interested as an educator working in that context. How how are young kids dealing with their older generation? Are are do they kind of go yeah yeah okay old old keys and familiarity? How do they engage with that? Is a question I'm curious to hear from you. Because again, it's interesting as the generations go by. What are the kids thinking about this? like the formulation of uncritical championing of identity above all else is 
just as hard as this, as the, the critical nature of identity. I really like the, the way you came up with this. And I tend to look at the, the issue of identity politics within uh, academic settings uh, in the context of this project in a trans-hemispheric fashion too. And I think our contexts diverge. This is the impression that I get very much. We, uh, some of you might disagree, but I don't think that uh, queer studies or maybe because we still do think a lot in terms of gender studies, they haven't gained much momentum in Brazil so far. As well as uh, we don't have a label such as native studies, uh, native studies departments here. We have uh, a different sort of arrangement, uh, as, and there's not as many indigenous scholars in Brazil as compared to Canada. And we could discuss that later as well. Uh, but my my final comment to to you would be. Uh, I'm really curious to know more about uh, how scholars who choose their field of research, study, of expertise based on their own identity, like lesbians studying lesbians and indigenous people studying indigenous people, how they are seen within the Canadian context with Latin Bank in Brazil. My sense is that they are seen in a suspicious, more suspicious way. Okay. And Just something also quickly to add to, to Riley's discussion, especially in, in a setting where there's so many disciplines. Um, identity politics, it, it's interesting how it takes on different kinds of uh, his, histories in different fields. So in the field of uh, applied linguistics, there was, um, there was the, um, I'm trying to remember who wrote this, talked about uh, identity was only offered in terms of the native and non-native speaker. And so the interesting thing is that identity politics offered a new way to kind of conceptualize uh, or reconceptualize issues of acquisition. Barriers to acquisition simply weren't trajectories on the road from, from uh, trying to approximate this construct, the native speaker norms. They became, especially Bonnie Norton's work, we needed to reconsider identity as serious social-based obstacles that prevented access to the rich kind of uh, access also in the terms of ethics, being taken seriously as worthy of speech, using the Bordeaux terms. So in a sense, the identity politics are different, and the other interesting identity politics has been methodological. So uh, at a time where we were not even allowed to consider narrative, auto-ethnography. Auto the identity politics enabled uh, fields like applied linguistics suddenly to have a, a rich and multiple set of ways of understanding uh, the challenges of language learning in the broader social context. So, and again, it's interesting to think about all our fields, because I know I was talking about specifically literary criticism, but identity takes on a new and different kind of genealogy across these fields, and it's interesting to consider that when we talk about the teaching implications and taking out for us. Anything else? Uh, great papers again. Thank you very much for presenting.